Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In today's video, we want to establish the Boole Mobius transform in the three variable case, where we get a pretty good idea of what's going to happen more generally. So, a remarkable connection with important aspects of combinatorics and partially ordered sets comes into focus. So let me remind you where we are currently with the two variable situation. We're thinking about a Boolean function with two variables a0 and a1 and the values of this function are now x0, x1, x2, x3 written in binary corresponding to the the way we are writing the input possibilities in terms of binary numbers. And then we've seen that we can express this in a sort of standard way as a Boole polynumber, first of all, in this fashion, so as a linear combination of 1, a0, a1, and the product a0, a1, with coefficients x0, x0 plus x1, x0 plus x2, and the sum of all 4 times a0, a1. And I also remind you that we introduced this sort of alternate notation for these terms that appear in the Boole polynumber expression, the a sub i's. So uh, x0 is actually a sub 0, and a0 is a sub 1, a1 is a sub 1 0 or a sub 2, and this thing here is represented by a sub 3. Okay, and then this gives us a correspondence between these coefficients, which we are calling y sub k, going from 0 to 3 in this case. So that would be y sub 0, y sub 1, y sub 2, and y sub 3. And the relationship between the y's and the x's is given by this basic equation here, where we employ linear algebraic notation. There's a vector y1, y2, y3, y4. There's the vector x1, x2, x3, x4. And to go from the x vector to the y vector, we multiply by this little 4x4 four four matrix. Now it's a matrix just with zeros and ones. It's upper triangular. In fact, it has ones along the diagonal. And there's sort of ones everywhere except there's a little uh, zero right there. And if we call this matrix T2, then it has the nice property that its inverse looks very much the same, except that there's a few minus signs also around. And so when we look at the inverse mod 2, we get exactly the same matrix as the original T2. That has the effect that the inverse Mobius transform going from the y's to the x's is given by the same formula as the Boole Mobius transform going from the x's to the y's. So what we want to do now is to look at this in the more general situation when we have three variables. It will be a bit more complicated, but it will bring into clear focus what this matrix is and where it's really coming from. And we'll be able to see, ultimately, that there's actually a very beautiful and simple connection with some combinatorics. Now to set the stage for that, I want to remind you of a very pleasant and sort of non-obvious correspondence that we get between integers and subsets by adopting a binary indexing. So with the two variable situation, here if we're counting in binary from 0 to 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, then we can sort of morph that into a correspondence with subsets of uh, a, the set a0, a1. Or maybe we could write it like that. So how do we do that? Well, we take the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and we make them all uh, the same size by adding some zeros on the left if necessary. So this 0 becomes 0, 0, this 1 becomes 0, 1, and these stay the same. Now they all have length 2, but they're still identifiably the numbers from uh, 0 to 3. And now we associate these to subsets of this set, and it's perhaps easier if we think of the set uh, sort of temporarily ordered like that, with the a0 on the right hand side and the a1 on the left. Okay, then these things here correspond to subsets because we think of the ones as being indicators of which elements we should include. So the 0, 0 means we're not including either of them. That's the empty set. The 0, 1 means we're including the a0, but not the a1. So that's the set a0. 
one zero is the set just consisting of a one and one one corresponds to the set with both of them. Okay, so we want to extend this first of all to a correspondence involving a three input set a0, a1, a2, which it's convenient to think about uh, arranging so that the a0 is on the right and then a1 and then a2 as we go left. Okay, so let's first of all have a look at the corresponding relation between counting in binary from 0 to 7 now and subsets of this three element set. Here is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in binary. Here are the corresponding triples where we've added some zeros to the left just to make sure that everything has three uh, elements. And then here are the corresponding subsets where again we just take one of these and interpret the rightmost entry as telling us whether a0 is included or not, then the next one telling us whether a1 is included or not, and the third one here telling us whether a2 is included or not. So this is the set A2, this is the set A0, A2, and so on. So the eight subsets of this three element set, now exactly corresponding to the numbers from 0 to 7 in binary. Now, these subsets also correspond to the fundamental terms that appear in a Boole Pauli number. When we expand a Boole Pauli number in this context out, we're getting terms which involve these, these kinds of things. This one here we sort of interpret as being 1. This is just a0, this is a1, this is the product a0, a1, this is a2, this is the product a0, a2, the product a1, a2, the product a0, a1, a2. So every Boole Pauli number is just a linear combination of these eight things. And then I remind you that we've introduced this alternate notation for these entries in terms of little a's, where we just adopt the convention that the, the subscripts here are going to be the binary numbers that are corresponding. So instead of writing a0, a1, we write a11. Instead of writing a2, we write a100 or a4. Okay. So Make sure that you're happy with this correspondence. Okay, so here is our main slide that we really want to understand. We have three input variables, a0, a1, a2, arranged this way. The usual binary ordering of the various eight possibilities of zeros and ones for the inputs. And now the general Boolean function with values x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7. And what we want to do is we want to express this as a Boole Pauli number. So we're doing it now in the general case rather than in a special case. But it's a little bit more work, but it's more instructive also. So because we don't know which one of these is going to be 0 or 1, any one of them could be either 0 or 1, we have to include a line for each one of them. The first line, x0, is multiplied by the term 1 plus a0, 1 plus a1, 1 plus a2. This will be 1 precisely when these three inputs are 0. The x1 here is multiplied by a corresponding product over here, which is a0, 1 plus a1, 1 plus a2. The x2 multiplied by 1 plus a0, a1, 1 plus a2, and so on down to x7 multiplied by a0, a1, a2. So please check that that's correct. And now we have to expand this all out, thinking of it as a polynomial or polynumber in a0, a1, a2. The constant term that doesn't involve any of those three is only obtained in one place. That's when we multiply this one times this one times this one times x0. So x0 is the only constant term that appears. What about a0? Where do we get an a0 term as a result? Well, here we could get an a0 by multiplying with this one and this one. That would give us a next zero. Here also we can get an a0 because there's a one and one we can multiply by. We'll get an x1. But there's no other a0 appearing in the rest of them. So the coefficient of a0 is just x0 plus x1. What about the coefficient of a1? Well, that occurs right here, a1 times 1, 1. So there's an x0 contribution. 
Over here, there's no A1 term because everything has an A0 in it. But over here, there's an A1 term. We can get it by multiplying by that one and that one. So we get an X2. Here, no A1 by itself. Here, no A1 by itself. Also not here or here or here. So there's only X0 plus X2 times A1. What about A0 a1, well, that's the same kind of thing that happened in the two variable case. It appears here, 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 and here, and not in any of these. Now, when we include the A2 term, let's have a look at A2. Where does A2 appear? It can appear in the top entry with coefficient x0. And it can also appear right here at this row, because there's an A2 times 1 times 1. So that'll give us an x4 also. So there's an x0 plus x4 times a2. How about a0 times a2? Uh, that can happen here. So a0 times a2 times 1, x0. It can also happen with x1. a0 times a2 times 1, so x1. With x4, so a2 times a0 times 1, x4. And with x5, a0 times 1 times a2. X5. I'll leave you to check that with A1, A2, the possibilities are X0, X2, X4, and X6. And with all three terms, well, they occur uh, with every term, X0, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6, X7. So this is the final expression of the general Boole poly number that arises when you have a general Boolean function. So this is very nice because now we can see a rather simple linear relationship between the entries of the Boolean function, the xi's, and these entries here, which we might call the yi's. So we rewrite that same expression instead of using the capital AI inputs in terms of the little a's and the subscripts. So this thing here, for example, a101, that's a short form for capital A0 times capital A2. That's the coefficient of A0, A2, etc. Right? So these entries now are called the yi's. So we now think of this as being a sum of yk, ak. k goes from 0 to 7. So this would be y0, that's y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, y6, and y7. So that's a pleasant consequence of having relabeled our um, the terms of the Boole poly number with these A's with binary subscripts. And now we can talk about the Boole Mobius transform in this three variable situation. Okay, so what we're doing is we're starting with the vector of X's and we're ending up with the vector of Y's. Here is the vector of y's, y0, y1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And here is the vector of x's, just short a little bit, so I have space. And here is the linear algebraic relation between them, in terms of a matrix that multiplies the x vector to get the y vector. And how do we read off this matrix from this expression? Well, the columns just correspond to the entries. So this first column is just x0. Plus zero times all, that's the, that's the y0 term. The, this one here is y1, that's x0 plus x1. Uh, y2 is x0 plus x2. y3 is x0 plus x1 plus x2 plus x3. And y4 is the x0 plus the x4. y5 is x0 plus x1 plus x4 plus x5 y6 is x0 plus x2 plus x4 plus x6. And the y7 is all of them. So this is the corresponding matrix that we're going to call T sub 3 because it's the transform matrix, the Boole Mobius transform, with three variables. And its dimensions are 2 cubed by 2 cubed. It's an 8 by 8 matrix which, however, we should think of as being indexed by the numbers 0 to 7 rather than 1 to 8.
Now have a look at this matrix, it's very pleasant. It's upper triangular, it has ones along the diagonal. In fact, it has ones or zeros everywhere, it's nothing else. It's a binary object really, it's living in the bifield world. Because the algebra that we're doing here is the algebra in the bifield. And it also has an interesting relation to the 4x4 four four matrix that we were talking about earlier. That's appearing actually here in the top left corner. Right? If we just go there and there, you see the original matrix that we started the lecture with. And in fact, the big matrix is obtained from this top left corner in a very simple and elegant way. We take this matrix here and we repeat it right there and we repeat it right there. In the bottom corner, we just put a big block of zeros. I want to point out that that same thing also happens uh, earlier on. So we didn't talk about the one variable case, but you might think about what that is. It's actually quite simple. The one variable case also has a matrix associated to it, and that's exactly this one here. The matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. That's kind of the core matrix that in some sense generates this entire story. Because the way to go from this little 2x2 two two matrix to the 4x4 four four matrix is exactly what I've just described. You take this 2x2 two two matrix and you copy it here and here and put a zero there. In fact, you could even go back one further and look at the 1x1 one one case, which is just this single matrix. And then to go from the single matrix to the 2x2, two two, you copy the single matrix here, here, and here, and put a zero there. Right? So that's what you do at each stage. And so it makes it pretty clear how we can generate this, uh, this sort of family of matrices very simply, in fact. Okay, that's, that makes it very simple. We can easily get a very big matrix, giving us a very big Boole Mobius transform. Of course, we still have to explain that that actually works, you know, that that's not just an observation, but it's actually a theorem. So we do have to touch base with some, some combinatorial mathematics. We have to understand what the, the formula for the ijth entry of this thing is. And that's where we meet some interesting connection with partially ordered sets. Okay, so let's have another look at this Boole Mobius matrix in the three variable case, what we're calling T sub 3. Let's call it T uh, here. And uh, we want to understand what the formula is for the ijth entry. And for that, first of all, we have to remind ourselves that we are really using a, a binary or mod 2 kind of indexing of the rows and columns. So we want to think about the, the rows as being indexed by 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and also the columns by also 0 up to 7. So this entry here, for example, that 1 is the entry in the 4, 5 position. 1, 0, 0 is 4. 1, 0, 1 is 5, that's the 4, 5 position. Well, this one here is the 5, 6 position. And here then is the theorem, which I might call the Boole Mobius matrix theorem, okay? Which tells us what the ijth entry of this thing is. It's either 1 or 0. It's 1 if i is a subset of j or i is included in j, and 0 otherwise. Now, i and j are numbers from 0 to 7. What do we mean by i included in j, or i a subset of j? That doesn't have an obvious meaning, so I have to explain this. I have to explain this inclusion. Okay, And we do that by remembering that we have a correspondence between these numbers, 0 to 7, and the subsets of our variable set, a0, a1, a2. Okay, I've just repeated that correspondence that I've already shown you before. So 1, 0, 1, that corresponds to the subset, a0, a2. 1, 1, 0 corresponds to the subset, a1, a2. Remember the the entries here are telling you whether you should uh, include a, an A0 on the right, include an A1 next, include an A2 after that. 
So once we have identified these entries, these labels, with these subsets of A0, A1, A2, then this inclusion relation is just the usual set theoretical inclusion. It's just saying when the corresponding set corresponding to I is a subset of the set corresponding to J. So for example, with 4 and 5, there's 4, there's 5, the corresponding sets are A2 and A0, A2. Now, is this set a subset of this set? Well, yes, it is. A2 is a subset of A0, A2. That's the reason why this entry here is a 1. And what about this entry here, which is the uh, 5, 6 entry? Here's the corresponding set for 5. Here's the corresponding set for 6. Is A0, A2 a subset of A1, A2? No, it's not. So 5 is not a subset of 6, that's why there's a 0 there, but 4 is a subset of 5, that's why there's a 1 here. So the binary representation of things is crucial, and having this correspondence between numbers and our set of variables is crucial to interpreting and to understanding, to getting this Boole-Mobius matrix theorem. So this is great. This has um, all kinds of ramifications. The upshot is for electrical engineers, for computer scientists, the simplicity of this formula, the fact that it connects with something that's actually quite close to computer scientists' heart. We're talking about subsets of, of a set, um, binary representations of those subsets. This is such a simple uh, and powerful formula that means that the problem of going from a Boolean function to the corresponding Boole polynomial becomes very simple. We can first of all apply linear transformations, we can apply this linear algebraic setup that's very powerful, and we have this beautiful, ultimately very simple uh, expression for the actual transform that takes the uh, the Boolean function vector to the Boole polynomial vector, or indeed goes backwards. So to understand this more fully and to sort of see how this pattern kind of uh, generalizes, we want to have a little bit more of a look at partially ordered sets and partial orders. This is really a partial order, and we'll see how the, the Mobius uh, function of the partially ordered set uh, arises here and, and connects with their story. So I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.